Hello. Okay, uh, we'll get started. So we were talking about controller design in the previous lecture. So we have covered some of the prerequisite material for this class, and then we covered uh, in the previous class we understood the concept of state. So state is all the variables that are making the decision. Uh, action is your decision variable, uh, whatever you are doing. And typically in engineering systems, the states would be a, uh, would lie in a Euclidean space. Sometimes it would be a binary variable, like 0, 1. Your action would lie in a Euclidean space. Or sometimes it could be a variable 0, 1. Or it could be an integer. And uh, and we talked about policies. And what policies are supposed to do is, it, is a control policy will map the state, the current state, the information that you have to action, the, the particular decision you want to make at that particular moment. Okay, and we were talking about everything in discrete time because most of the computer control systems are actually discrete time. That's why we are restricting ourselves to discrete time system in this class. Um, so here is the, the problem. This is my state update equation. I want to compute ut, which is, so actually I want to compute the policy gamma t, which takes as input the current state and outputs the current action that you're supposed to take. So this is the policy feedback policy. And we have learned one way, which is in your feedback control class when you study PID controller, PID tuning, you study the um, lead lag compensator design. It could be in your feedback control class. So in mechanical engineering, in chemical engineering, in electrical engineering, feedback controls is a core course in undergraduate curriculum. So I'm implicitly assuming that you have seen some of these concepts in your previous class, which is how do you design a PID controller that meets all the performance specifications? And if PID controller is not able to meet the performance specification, then you have to use something called a lead lag compensator design to compensate for that and be able to meet all the performance specification. And in your feedback controls class, the performance specifications typically are what's the peak time, what is the rise time, what's the maximum magnitude of the peak, uh, what's the state, state error, and things of that. All of that is something that you might have seen in the past. right? And that's a specific class of feedback policies that you have seen already in your in some of the previous classes that you may have taken. So instead of going through the design of the PID controller, which is something that we see all around us, so if you're using a washing machine, if you're using a dishwasher, if you're using a thermostat, there is some amount of PID control embedded in it, okay? And that's what we are using. Um, what we are going to talk about today is how do you design more intelligent control policy. And the reason why I'm calling it intelligent is because the control policy would be aware of the objective of your control. Okay? It's trying to minimize the fuel consumption. It's trying to minimize the energy consumption. It's trying to uh, maximize the comfort. The comfort. Uh, it's trying to minimize the error. Okay, So there could be any objective, any number of objectives. And what the policy is supposed to do is to minimize the object, minimize the cost function, or maximize the reward uh, or benefit. So we'll formulate everything as a minimization problem, and we try and understand in today's class how do you use dynamic programming or MPC to design this feedback policy that is aware of the performance criteria that you're using to judge that policy. And we talked about it in the previous class. So typically what you have is a performance index for that particular system. If you're trying to keep your car to the center of the lane, you probably want to have your performance index as some function of the how far 
the car, the center of gravity of car is with the center of the lane. How to decide what the center of the lane is? You look at the lane markings and try to interpolate and figure out where the center of the lane is. And of course, you have your situational awareness other means you know exactly where you stand in the road and you try to look at the error and you're going to minimize the absolute of the error other performance. If there is a performance attached to the system and in order to be very raw and general, here is what we want to do. I want to minimize J of gamma. So gamma is uh, the collection gamma 1 to gamma capital T. So this T goes from 1 to T, capital T. So there are capital T number of decision steps in this particular problem. So I want to minimize over all possible gamma of J of gamma, which is given by CT of XT UT plus C capital T plus 1 of x capital T plus 1, t goes from 1 to capital T, but this is not it, this is just the cost function, but we also have some constraints. What possibly could be a constraint in an air conditioning system? What's the constraint here? What's the constraint under which this air conditioning system is working? Sure, it wants to maximize the human comfort or it wants to minimize the total cost of cooling this room. Is there a constraint on this system, on this air conditioning system? What do you think? The maximum temperature it can go to. The maximum temperature it can go up to, right? So right now, uh, the maximum temperature it can go up to is uh, 70. Well, OK, actually, it's in the heating mode right now. That's not the only thing. What else? The cooling, OK. So the minimum temperature it should be at, and the maximum temperature it should be at. So if it's in the heating mode, uh, to heat the entire room all the way up to 70 degree Fahrenheit, right now the current state of this system is 68.9 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, so it has to heat all the way up to 70 degrees Fahrenheit. But of course, when it's hot outside, today it's cold. I mean, for some reason, it's cold today. But if it is hot outside, it has a mandate. This particular thermostat has a mandate to cool down the room to 72 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, so um, I'm going to add constraints. So there are constraints which can be written as no. And this constraint must be satisfied for all t. OK. So this is known as equality constraint. This is known as inequality constraint. And if you think about it, we want our temperature, xt, to be less than or equal to 72 degrees Fahrenheit and greater than or equal to 70 degrees Fahrenheit. I can write it as two constraints with inequalities, xt minus 72 less than or equal to 0, 70 minus xt less than or equal to 0, OK? So this is the original constraint that somebody from the top, let's say the president of the university, told me that this temperature should be between 70 to 72. But now, just because she told me doesn't mean uh, that's how I will enter in the computer. In the computer, I'm going to enter these two constraints. Okay, so I'm going to re rewrite those constraints as inequality constraints as that xt minus 72 is less than or equal to 0, 70 minus xt is less than or equal to 0. So that gives me the constraints in the form of less than or equal to 0. Um, 
there are in some situations there could be equality constraints. Uh, so for instance, if you're driving at this speed and you are accelerating at this rate, then the gear number has to be five or four or something like that. So there, those are the equality constraints where there is a hard constraint. You cannot really, uh, you don't really have a wiggle room in those constraints. Is uh, well, so the question is, is, there is it necessary for a system to have these constraints? Um, it's not necessary, but I haven't seen a system where the constraints are not there. Uh, but that's partly because I've looked at air conditioning literature or, or HVAC literature, and I've looked at vehicle literature, and I'm a theoretical researcher. So by default, I implicitly assume that constraints will be there. Um, and in those particular literature, constraints are always there, okay? Um, nowadays, batteries are pretty famous. So batteries have a constraint. You can be at, at most 0% charge and at, sorry, at the minimum, you will be 0% charge and at the maximum, you will be 1%, sorry, 100% charge. You can't go beyond 100% and you can't go below 0%, okay? So that's the constraint on the battery. So there, in the battery case, XT should be, than greater than or equal to 0 and less than or equal to 1, okay? So those are the constraints under which we will be working in real systems. Uh, controllers typically have saturation limits. You can't really accelerate beyond like 100 miles per hour square or something like that. So, so therefore, in that particular situation, your action UT 100 greater than zero, or maybe you can break at this particular rate. So U, UT is between minus 50 and 100. In the case of a car, so you cannot accelerate beyond 100 miles per hour square, and you cannot break below minus 50 miles per hour square. Okay. I don't know, I just picked these numbers at random, so I don't know what the actual limits are. But I'm sure if you're using a performance car, these limits are going to be different. If you're using a regular car, the limits are going to be different. If you're driving in a snowy weather, these limits are going to be different. If you're driving in a, in a stormy weather, then these limits are going to be different. So a lot of engineering goes into identifying what the limits are for these dynamic systems. Okay, there are millions of papers on it so far. So not something you can take lightly. Or any question, any other question? Yes. Right. Well, the, first, without the cost function, it's it's taking care of the performance uh, specification. Correct. Correct. Now, with the cost function realized, is it taking care of like both? And this is into account, or only seeing the, co the cost function? It's only taking into account this cost function. So your cost function should be in rich enough mm -hmm. to take into account all the other performance okay. specifications, like uh, steady state error and all that stuff, peak time. And that feedback policy, yeah. And you, you said that there are uh, gamma one and also gamma t. Right. This is policies are different. That's right. That's right. Okay. So the policies will change with time. Okay. So when you are designing, so that's actually an important point. When you're designing controllers in your 3551 class, which is the feedback controls class, um, you, you're given the performance specification and you try to figure out the optimal gain values to meet the performance specification. And those gains actually don't change with time. Those are steady state, like the gains are what it is, and then it meets all the criteria. Uh, now, those are okay in unconstrained system where there are no constraints, you know, on the controller or on the state. But when you have constraints on the state and on actions, uh, you really cannot use those kind of controllers. So what you do is you change the gain with time, okay? Uh, or, or you trigger the gain depending on the state. So if the gate is half open, you use some gains, and if the gate is half closed, then you use some other gains. So um, those are more complicated policies that is not typically taught in a feedback controls class. Okay, and now slowly, 
because of more sensors and because of embedded controllers that are cheap and easy to deploy, uh, you can directly jump to these policies rather than thinking about what the gain should be, uh, which you, sh you would have thought if this was 1970s and you were designing an electric vehicle, then you have to figure out, okay, what gain should I use at different stages of charging or discharging? So, uh, so anyways, we are over that period and we directly jump to this particular situation. Any other question? It's also important to note that when you were designing feedback policies in using PID controllers or using lead lag controllers, it's not like there is a unique lead lag controller or a unique PID controller that will meet all the performance specification. You might have like a million different possibilities, but you still want to, say, minimize the energy consumption, total energy consumption. So you want to find what is the best PID controller among all these one million or one billion different PID controllers that I have that all meet the performance specification. So there's a lot of ways by which you can uh, think about or conceptualize these problems, uh, but, uh, but for the purpose of this particular class, which is 5555, we will implicitly assume that this is the performance index that you want to minimize, and that's it. It contains all the information that is needed for making the decision. <coughs> okay, any other question? Okay. So I have this, uh, I want to minimize the cost subject to constraints. Now this is a very complicated problem. There is a transition dynamics, there is cost function, there are constraints. So let's try and solve a simpler problem first, and then we will extend that simple problem to this complicated dynamic problem. So the simple problem is, I have one step, I have no state, I have no noise. Uh, so this is noise, this is state, this is action. So I only have action, no state, no noise. I have a cost function, I have equality constraint and inequality constraint. So very simple problem. So I want to minimize C of u such that H of u equals to zero, G of u is less than equal to zero. And I want to minimize over u and Rn. Oh, I haven't mentioned, but let me mention it. So x is in Rn, u is in Rm, w is in MnOp, let me use P, uh, yeah, and I'm going to make it Rm. And gamma, gamma is a map from Rn to Rm, so it's actually a function. Okay. So this is the problem that I'm facing, very simple problem. And the question is, what can we say about this problem? So I just want to talk about KKD theorem, which is something that if you're taking the optimization class, we will talk about it in October. But in this class, we are compressing the entire 5759 in two classes. So let's talk about KKT theorem, okay, which is a necessary condition for optimality for this problem. So, So in order to introduce KKD theorem, I need to provide a couple of definitions. Set of active constraints at U. Uh, Okay, I have to make further assumptions. So C is a function from Rm to R. H is a function from Rm to 
are capital H and G is a function from Rm to R capital G. Okay, so H has capital H number of components and G has capital G number of components. So the set of active constraints at U U is okay one to capital H well I don't know how do I index H and G so as to have a non overlapping index. because G also goes from one to capital G. Okay, let me write it in some fashion and then we will try to figure out how to fix it later on. Sorry about that. So these are always active because uh, these constraints always have to be met. And then J in 1 to capital G such that GJ of U equals to 0. No, I don't like it. I don't like it. So let me write it as I from 1 to H and J from 1 to G such that G J U equals to 0. Yeah, I think this may be better. So the set of active constraints at U are all these uh, functions that are equal to 0. So H of U is always equal to 0. So all the indices in H uh, will always be there. In the equality constraints will always be there. But the indices for inequality constraints will, all, will only be there if that inequality constraint is active. If it is inactive, those constraints are not counted in the set of active constraints at U. Okay, any question about this definition? Okay, so HI of U is always zero here and GJ of U is always zero for all J that are active. Okay, uh, and then we have another definition U is regular if gradient of H1, gradient of HM, H capital H and gradient of GJ, J in AU are linearly independent. Yeah. 
So we look at all the active constraints at u, we take the derivative of those functions, and we want those functions to be linearly independent. Well, these are all vectors, so we want all these vectors to be linearly independent. Um, then we call that point u to be regular point. So how do we check for regularity? We look at all the active constraints at u. We look at the derivative of these functions uh, that are active. And they, these all derivatives have to be linearly independent. So that's how we check for regularity. Typically, if you're solving a real world problem, I mean, this is a lot of mathematical mumbo jumbo, but the fact of the matter is if you're solving a real world problem, these conditions are typically satisfied. So you don't really have to worry about it, whether a point is regular or not. So, but for the sake of mathematical completeness, we have to talk about them because if you are by any chance in a situation where things are not regular, then these conditions will not be satisfied. So this is my KKT theorem. U star, U star is the optimal solution. So U star is optimal and regular implies there exists lambda star in RH mu star in R g mu star greater than or equal to 0. Actually, this should be part of the condition such that Okay, so, so if you are solving this optimization problem, what's the necessary conditions for optimality, which means how do you check whether a point is optimal or not? So this is the necessary conditions for optimality. And what it says is if u star is optimal and regular, there exist lambda star and mu star. These are known as Lagrange multipliers. So there exist Lagrange multipliers such that the derivatives added in certain fashion is equal to zero. The Lagrange multipliers corresponding to inequality constraints, so remember mu star is Lagrange multiplier corresponding to this inequality constraints. They are non-negative for every j and it's equal to zero 
for all j that is not active at u star. So all the constraints that are not active at u star, the Lagrange multiplier corresponding to that constraint will be equal to zero. Okay, lambda star is the Lagrange multiplier corresponding to the equality constraint. Mu star is Lagrange multiplier corresponding to the inequality constraint. Okay, so this is KKT theorem. And typically, uh, if you solve an optimization problem on MATLAB using fmincon or in Python using scipy.minimize, so those are the two functions for solving optimization problems of this type, fmincon and MATLAB, let me write it. So in MATLAB, it's fmincon. And in Python, it's scipy dot minimize. So these are the functions you would call to solve a problem of this type. And it will give you, when you call these functions, it will give you not just u star, but it will also give you lambda star and mu star because it solves for the Lagrange multipliers as well. Okay, so I talked about this particular theorem purely to introduce Lagrange multipliers and what their operational meaning is in an optimization problem. And they have a lot of meaning attached. I mean, Lagrange multipliers have a lot of meaning attached to it, uh, which is typically ignored in the literature, but I, I don't ignore it uh, in my research. And that what, what, what's the meaning of Lagrange multiplier will actually be taught in 5759. So if you're taking that class, uh, you will have to wait until you understand what exactly do these Lagrange multipliers mean. Um, just to give you an idea of why Lagrange multipliers are important, you know, we all use electricity, but how are the prices of electricity determined? Well, the prices of electricity is determined by solving a problem of this type. I want to minimize the total cost of production subject to some constraints. And the prices of electricity is actually exactly equal to lambda i star. So when we see five cents per kilowatt hour, that's actually the Lagrange multiplier corresponding to some constraint in this optimization problem. And if you're taking 5759, uh, this is the homework problem in assignment one to compute lambda star. Um, so, so you will get to it if you take optimization class at some point of time. So, so this is uh, uh, so this is KKD theorem. It tells you you use KKD theorem in order to come up with algorithms to solve this optimization problem. And in MATLAB, the algorithm is fmincon. In Python, the algorithm is scipy.minimize. Specifically, there are three algorithms. OK. Specifically, there are three algorithms that are widely used for solving this optimization problem. The first algorithm the first one is method of multipliers. The second is a sequential quadratic program. And the third one is uh, trust region constraint optimization.
okay so if you go into a car industry or places like general electric or in places like uh, robotics companies and you have to solve a problem of this type it's quite likely that you will be using one of these three methods with very high probability you will be using one of these three methods to solve the problem on an embedded microcontroller okay if you have a computer you can use scipy.minimize or fmincon to solve the problem so you don't really have to code it but if you are actually running it on embedded microcontrollers you actually have to code the algorithm and these algorithms are taught in the optimization class okay any questions so far we'll get back to the original control design problem after this any questions no okay so the way to solve the dynamic problem is using a algorithm called dynamic programming algorithm And what this algorithm suggests is if you want to compute an optimal solution to a dynamic problem, you have to go backwards. So you have to start with the terminal time step, and then you have to proceed in an iterative fashion and optimize all the way up to the beginning. So what is this algorithm? So it basically says, let me define my value function at time t plus 1 equal to the terminal cost. So this is the terminal cost. And this is my terminal value. Terminal value function. So I set my terminal value function to be equal to the terminal cost. And then I'm solving the following problem. I want to minimize oh, uh, Vt of Xt Wt is going to be equal to minimize over ut ct oh ct xt ut plus vt plus 1 ft xt ut wt such that
of costs, that was the, the second term of the cost. Uh, right. The that's right. Cost. That's right. So terminal cost would be the uh, one of the cost function. Sorry, capital yeah. T. Capital T or T plus one. Capital T plus one. Right? Yeah. 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 Okay, so, so this is the way to solve the problem. You define the value function at the terminal time step and then you go back Vt where you need the value function at Vt plus 1. Okay, then you go to Vt minus 1, capital T minus 1, you need the value V capital T and so on and so forth. So you go backwards. Now how do you solve this problem? Remember Xt is an Rn. Wt is an Rp. So these are all Euclidean spaces. So how would you solve this problem? Any thoughts? You have to solve this problem, this minimization problem for every Xt and every Wt. Right? How many Xt's and Wt's are in Rn and Rp? How many states are there in Euclidean space? It's a uncountable number of states. There are billions and billions and billions and billions of states in Euclidean space. So I can't really solve it in computer for every xt and wt, so what should I do? Any idea? Define a subspace. Uh, subspace. How about subset? Okay, subspace has a specific meaning. It has to be a hyperplane, which also contains billions and billions and billions of points. So what you do is you have this. This is the state. This is the noise. And what you do is you pick discrete number of points within this space, maybe like uh, 200 points in the entire space, and then you solve the problem for every xt wt pair, and somehow you do some linear interpolation or quadratic interpolation to identify the value function at an intermediate point. So let's say these are the points at which you have computed the vt of xt wt, this is the point at which you want to find out what Vt and Vt of Xt comma Wt looks like. You will look at the surrounding points and you will do some sort of linear interpolation to figure out what the value function at that point is. So implementing this algorithm is a big challenge in, in embedded microcontrollers. And, uh, and new methods are coming up. And we are also contributing to development of new methods for solving problems of this type in real time. Uh, but this problem comes up in a lot of variety of situations uh, in, in real world systems. And uh, it's a very hot topic right now in research to come up with methods for solving this kind of problem. But for small dimensional situations where xt is say one or two dimensional like this thermostat, Wt could be one or two dimensional, you can solve this problem. It's not that difficult on an embedded system. Only when you start going to higher dimensional system, let's say a very large oil pipeline or a very large chemical plant or an autonomous vehicle, you really cannot solve this problem that easily. You have to spend a lot of effort in making it work. But nonetheless, it allows us to identify a strategy, a control policy, and the gamma star t of xt and wt would be the argument of this problem. Okay, so in this case, the policy would depend on wt. If you do not have wt, if the noise is zero, then the policy would depend only on xt. In this particular problem, because I'm considering the noise, wt everywhere, 
the policy would become a function of WT as well. Okay. And the way to compute the policy is also the same. You have the optimal policies, optimal actions at all these points. You want to find the optimal action for this point, you will do some sort of linear interpolation to figure out what the optimal point looks like. Uh, I'm not saying some of these, uh, these methods are very easy to do. It's going to take a lot of effort to write the code for doing that interpolation. But it's doable. It's not unheard of in this area. OK? So this is the way to compute the optimal solution to or, or, or uh, come up with an optimal policy, control policy, in a dynamic setting where you want to minimize the performance index. Uh, this method was popular, I mean, developed in 1950s and in 1960s. Um, some variation of this method was used in the Apollo mission that put the man on the moon, right? So in 1960s, this was actually used on the rocket that went to the moon, okay? In fact, it's of course used in all the rockets ever since. Uh, and that time, the microcontroller on which not this algorithm, but a variation of this algorithm. Uh, it was, it was uh, executed on a microcontroller or on a computer, which had much less processing power than our cell phones today. OK, so uh, just to give you that these are very powerful algorithms. They have, we have been able to put the man on the moon using algorithms of this type. Don't take them lightly, OK? Uh, okay, so this provides you with a policy for the dynamic optimization problem. Now, I wanted to cover something else as well. Oh, yes. So this is a lot of mumbo jumbo with hi fi theory which we don't care about, or oh, no, I care about it. Maybe you know, those of you who will go to industry may not care too much about it. So let's try to study a specific instance of this algorithm in the context of linear systems. OK, so we want to consider the system where ft of xt, ut, wt equals to axt plus BUT, so I'm assuming that the noise is absent, WT is equal to zero. And I'm going to assume that my J of gamma is uh, summation XT transpose Q XT plus UT transpose RUT plus OK. So this is known as linear system. So this is a linear system because the, uh, the transition, the state transition function is linear in x and linear in u. So it's a linear system. And this is a quadratic cost because 
The cost is quadratic in state and quadratic in action. And the terminal cost is quadratic in the state, the terminal state. So this is known as linear quadratic regulator problem, LQR. Linear quadratic regulator problem. And let me, let me try and motivate. Do I have time? Yeah, I do have some time. Let me try to motivate why should we study this particular problem, OK? Uh, it's important to know how do we go from the nonlinear setting that we were talking about so far to that linear setting that we really have not seen until now. So here is the issue. Uh, we already know from experience. So let's say I'm an operator who has operated some machine for 50 years of my life. So I kind of know what's the optimal. Like Because of my experience, I know that, that this is the optimal trajectory. And this is the optimal. No, I shouldn't say optimal, but I should say near optimal. near optimal trajectory. So I'm a pilot. I've been flying planes all my life. I have made some mistakes in my flying career. So over the long period of time, I have kind of realized that if I have to take a right turn in the air, this is how I should be flying the plane. Everybody is happy under those conditions. So that's my near optimal trajectory and near optimal action. Uh, so that's for a pilot. If you are an operator for a chemical plant, again, the same thing. Like, I I'm an operator. I've been doing this for 15 years. And I kind of know this is what you should be doing in these situations. OK? So that's near optimal trajectory and near optimal action. It's not optimal. OK? It's near optimal. Now, you come in as a young guy who just learned about dynamic program. And you want to say that, hey, look, I can actually make it optimal, like truly optimal, or, or something that's actually very, 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 very close to optimal. So how would you do that? So here is the trick. I have my xt plus 1 equals to ft of xt ut. I'm going to subtract the near optimal trajectory and on both the sides, OK? So I'm going to look at xt plus 1 minus x bar t plus 1. Okay, so I subtracted x bar t plus 1 on both the sides. And time is up, so I cannot go any further. So I'll let you be on this cliffhanger, and we'll talk about it after the long weekend on Wednesday. Okay? Think about it. What should I do after this? It's the Answer is Taylor series. We have to do some Taylor series expansion. So we'll talk about it, and we'll get a system of this type and a cost function of this type. So we'll talk about it on Wednesday. Have a great weekend.